So, for those of you who watched the first video, there's a link here to the first one, which was kind of an overview of how I got in trouble and couldn't make all the video, or at least one video that I'd like. There's the overview. So, as I look back, and I'm looking at each year, 2010, 2011, and so on, what were the things that I remember about those years in the last 10 years of our lives ago that were red letter days, the things that made me go, whew, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. And life with Cindy means that there was a number of things that in the last 10 years I've figured out that Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. So as I look back at the pictures and I look back at the time, the first one that I want to talk about is what happened in 2010. What were the four things in 2010 that are red letter days or things that stand out for me, not necessarily by event, but by category that made me realize that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. The first thing that I noticed is that all the family and friends that I had not been around were all of a sudden every place that I went. We moved from Oklahoma to South Carolina and well, first of all, we moved to Louisiana in 1990, and then we moved to South Carolina in 92. So I was away from my family. I was away from my friends. And not that we had spent a lot of time with family and friends when we were closer in, but we spent a lot less time with them when we were further out. And the first thing that I noticed is all of a sudden my life was slapped full of family and friends. The first indication was that birthday party I talked about, my 50th birthday. For those of you who don't know me, my mom's a CPA and my birthday is on the 15th of April. So most of my birthday parties were taking a stack of tax returns to the post office downtown Oklahoma City at 11.45 because they needed to get postmarked that day. My mom had a bunch of things on her plate and a birthday party for me sometimes didn't make it on the 15th of April. I mean, it was always a nice birthday and there was always cool things to do, but 15th of April, not so much. But if you recall what I talked about, my 50th birthday party, Cindy put a party together for me at Love and War in Texas, in Plano, Texas, the Radney Foster concert. And people that I hadn't seen and people that I hadn't been around much in a very long time were all of a sudden there. For example, in 1976, 1977, heck, I don't even remember when, Chuck Lynn and I became running buddies and we were running around together and Chuck was a friend of mine and kept me out of jail because I was kind of wild and Chuck was always there for me. He was a great friend, good and great friend that I hadn't seen much. And comes my birthday party, my 50th birthday party and Chuck Lynn's there. 1978, fall of 78, I met Brian Washburn. I hadn't spent a lot of time around Brian Washburn, but you know what? When it came time for my 50th birthday party, Cindy made sure that Brian Washburn was there and my aunt and my cousins and my family. And so there's a bunch of pictures that show up here that are friends and family pictures. And that was the first thing that changed is Cindy made sure that my friends and family were a part of my life again. And everything that we did in any place that we went and anything that we did involved my family and friends, whether it was a vacation in Mexico, a birthday party, or a dinner put together when my nephew gets married. So the first thing that changed for me in 2010 that was a step-level change, a total we're not in Kansas anymore moment, was I was surrounded by my family and friends. And I was surrounded by my family and friends because I married Cynthia Crowell. Second thing that I noticed in 2010 was, honest to no lie, we're a couple. And when I say we're a couple, I mean we're a couple. We're joined at the hip. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, we want to be around each other. I look under my arm and Cindy's there. And Cindy's there when the family's there. And Cindy's there when the family's not there. And Cindy's there. Cindy's there. I guess the first indication I had, and I, again, there's the link. When I was driving back to Charlotte, after we had spent New Year's together, she jumped in the car to ride to Birmingham, Alabama with me because she just wanted to be with me. So the second thing I noticed is not only did I have family and friends every place I looked, but that I was married to somebody that wanted to be a couple with me and wanted to spend all the time that she could with me and wanted to include all the other people in the world if we could but at the end of the day, we were a couple. 
and that we had a special relationship and that that relationship was something that went on all day, every day, any place we were, whether I was in Charlotte and we were on the phone together or we were in the hill country of Texas. That's the second thing that I noticed about 2010 is all of a sudden we were a couple and we were going to be a couple. The next memory, and it kind of falls into those things, was the wedding itself. And Cindy put that wedding together in, in a heartbeat. I think we had six weeks, five weeks to put a wedding together. And because we wanted to be married on 10-10-10, which was on a Sunday, we were trying to figure out how we were going to get married on a Sunday on short notice and still get, like Josh, back to South Carolina for visitation. And, and it was a complicated thing. So how are we going to get married on 10-10-10? Not 10-9, not 10-11, 10-10-10. Well, Cindy figured out that what we would do is we'd be married at midnight. And if we're going to get married at midnight, maybe the party needed to happen backwards. Most people have a wedding and everybody marches into the wedding and they sit down and they're looking at the other side over there and they don't know who those people are because it's a different side of the church. Well, the way Cindy planned this wedding is what we did is we started at 9 o'clock. We had an open bar and past hors d'oeuvres and a party with dancing and music starting at 9 o'clock. And then after that 9 o'clock thing, then we stopped, moved out of that room to go cut the cake, <laughs> have coffee, and have a have the reception. It was a reception, not just the dancing and drinking, but the reception. So we had coffee and cake at 11, and then we got married at midnight. And I'll tell you something. It changed the nature of our wedding. Our wedding was unique in every way that you can think of. Not only do we do it backwards, but the sense of community that we had developed by drinking and dancing and partying with people for a couple of three hours before we got married meant that everybody in the room knew each other. Families and friends had spent time together, met each other. We had a time before the wedding ever happened. And the cool thing was when we got in the car and left, we left. It wasn't like leaving the ceremony to go to the rehearsal or leaving the ceremony to go to the reception. It was leaving. The thing that's most unique about this, and I'll tell the story again because some people don't know it and most people do. The way Cindy and I met was in 1977 when I was an athletic trainer at Bowie High School. And I was the most mature of the athletic trainers, let that watch over you. So I had the women's programs. And the only reason, of course, that I watched the drill team practice was to see if there was an injury so that I could diagnose the injury and come up with treatment as quickly as possible. Anyway, there was a lieutenant on the drill team, the prettiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I went to the training room one day, and Pete Carlin, who's our trainer, and if you want to look up Pete Carlin, he's in the Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. He's in the, um, uh, he's in the Hall of Fame for UTA for being their athletic director. Pete Carlin's great people. Pete handed me a ace bandage and said, hey, go out and wrap one of the lieutenant's groin muscles. She pulled a groin muscle, and I'm on it, coach. And I go out there, and it's her. So I turned witty and charming up to about 12. And while I'm wrapping her groin, and she's never seen me before. She doesn't know me from Adam. She thinks some college guy's being awfully friendly to this high school junior. She didn't have anything to do with me. Didn't want to have anything to do with me. But that's how we met, was me wrapping her thigh. So... We're putting this wedding together, and I'm in Charlotte, and she's in Dallas, and she's doing all this wedding stuff. And I get to the wedding that night, and she said, I, I got you a groom's cake. And I said, well, that wasn't in the budget. See our earlier discussion about she does things that I wouldn't have paid for that become the most important things that I can think of. And she showed me the groom's cake, and here's a picture of it. That ought to tell you something about the kind of life and the kind of relationship we've got and the kind of memories we create. In that wedding, I had friends from South Carolina. I had family from North Carolina. I had family from Oklahoma. I had friends from all over the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. I had the people that I'd gone to high school with and gone to college with, all in that wedding. And that wedding that was planned backwards and planned different than any other wedding in the world. It's another indication that my life had changed. Instead of following some convention one way or another, Cindy decided what it is that we wanted and then figured out a way to get it done. Figured out a way to get it done with the people involved so that we had a nosh that the family got together before the wedding so we had time to spend time together. And figured out a way to have an out-of-town party before the wedding and before the nosh so people get to know each other. 
and then figure out how to do the wedding backwards so that we could get the 10-10 date that we wanted as well as the party that we deserved. That's the way our wedding was. Completely different than anything you've ever been to. And I will tell you today that everybody was at that wedding. And if you were at that wedding, you put some comments below about how special that wedding was. It was the most unique and interesting wedding that you could have ever possibly attended. My life changed. 10, 10, 10. And it changed because she finds a way to get it done for family and friends and everybody else. The final signpost in 2010 that told me that I was in a different world was, I don't remember how many days, I think it was 38 days, 41 days, I, I really don't remember, after we got married. Cindy's dad, Bill Kroll, passed away up in the panhandle of Texas. Bill Kroll was a great friend of mine, and he had been for as long as I'd known him from 1979, 1980, Bill was good people. And Bill was a gun guy and a knife guy. He was all the time trading guns. One time he traded for a Weatherby 458, an elephant gun. You can shoot through an elephant one end to the other. And Bill called and said, hey, I got this elephant gun. I'm going to go shoot it. You want to go? And I said, oh, hell yeah, let's go. So we get out to the range, and he's got this 458 Weatherby Magnum, and I get on the ground behind it. He's going to let me shoot it first. And I torched that bad boy off, and it kicked the snot out of me. That gun had some recoil. And I got up off the ground. I cycled the bolt and got up off the ground. I said, here, yeah, you can shoot it. And he said, oh, hell no, I don't want to shoot it. I just want to see you shoot it. <laughs> so in, uh, in that summer of 2010, I had called Bill to ask him if it was all right with him if I married Cindy. I told him I couldn't get out to the panhandle of Texas to talk to him in person, so I'd have to do it over the phone. And I asked him if it'd be all right. And what he said to me will stick with me the rest of my life. He said, son, I've been waiting to hear you say that for 30 years. I'd love to have someone like you take care of my best work. Well, not long after we got married, Bill, Bill hit his head, had a brain bleed, and passed away. So, as... You can see in the pictures here, we went up to Amarillo to have the funeral. And that's when I found out something else. There was an indication that my life had changed. Because of the things that had happened, for one reason or another, I ended up being a preacher, well, or ordained a minister at least. And I, people say I was ordained online. I, I like to think of it that we actually had a discussion before I got ordained. But I'm a minister in the Universal Life Church. And Cindy asked me if I would do the funeral for her dad. Now, there's a step level change in a relationship or the kind of relationship when you have your wife ask you to officiate at her father's funeral. And it's for as long as I live I'll remember standing there at that graveside in the panhandle of Texas, some of the most beautiful country in the world, and getting ready to do Bill Crow's funeral. And the Air Force was there because he had flown fighters in the United States Air Force. The Air Force was there, and they were doing the flag ceremony to give Lou Bill's flag. And I'm standing there watching them do this, knowing that guy <laughs> that i got to start talking in about 30 seconds. And to look at Cindy standing there trusting me to do something so important and having the trust of somebody that would give you that kind of ceremony at that kind of time after we'd been married for 40 days told him my life had changed. So those are the things that I remember about 2010. I got my family and friends back, became a couple, Found out that you don't have to follow convention to get done what you want to do. And found out that I was married to somebody that trusted me implicitly with the most important things in her life. That's what I remember about 2010. Give us a comment below if you were involved in those things because we'd like to hear from you. But that was 2010 and our 10-year anniversary.